Thank you very much. Uh, I want to express uh, thanks to Zurich Instruments first for uh, hosting uh, Orange Quantum Systems here um, to let you all know a little bit about um, what we feel that is near and dear to our mission as a company. We provide test equipment um, to at cryo conditions. Um, yeah, to measure your chips uh, effectively, and it's all encoded in our. Yeah, yeah, there you go. The in our slogan of know your quantum chip. Um, it's gonna be a little less technically heavy, and as it's just explaining explaining what we think is the most important thing for quantum computing to be very useful in the future. And then also this talk will be answering, I hope. Mm, yeah. All these three uh, questions would then be correlated um, and how we are actually helping to make sure that quantum computing in the future would be actually useful. Um, to save some time, I would have to say that it's now really, truly becoming a reality. Um, I was also involved together with my co-founders in the Quantum Inspire project, um, building Europe's and I guess world's first uh, multi-platform QC. Um, that said, what we really thought of at that time was most important thing in the chip. I could be uh, wrong, but it would be the quantum compute thing unit itself, the QPU. So it was really cool to see that a year after that there will be already a uh, commercially available uh, QPU. And then also really cool is that in 2022, um, we got Europe's first uh, actual quantum chip professional fabrication facility. And then the next year and last year, we found out there was a, another metric to measure uh, quantum usefulness. And it really, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter um, what metric we want to use. Regardless, though, in order to scale up uh, towards FTQC or anything that is really, truly useful, we really need better quality qubits and also a ton of them. Um, and the only way we can actually do that is through also not only through scientific breakthroughs, like um, what you're doing right now in your lab, but also we need to think a little bit more about how our processes in the lab can actually be more compatible towards, say, these traditional semiconductor foundries and uh, fabrication process. And one thing really cool with the collaboration with IMAC and this, especially this project was we identified that um, I think our partners in IMAC, they, they focused on the foundry compatible processes. Um, <laughs> this is still something really cool for me as a mathematician. Um, like this is really an engineerable or en yeah, something that we can artificially create uh, just by sending flux pulses or even some microwave drives into the uh, cavity. And yeah, something that we can actually fabricate uh, in order for us to manipulate an artificial atom uh, and then do some uh, nice quantum physics on it. And what is really cool is that from our partners at IMAC is that they identified um, really compatible uh, processes to make sure that we're not we're not uh, needing too many customizations in the regular uh, semiconductor fabrication chain and process. So the back end of line and the magnetic I think magnetic tunnel junction. Um, I'm the commercial guy, so I'm not really into the uh, technical stuff here. But all I know is that they found out a way to find and produce transponds or superconducting qubits through these uh, compatible uh, process. But what we also noticed was another bottleneck that we found because 
guess what? Even though you can actually fabricate these uh, chips or in a single wafer, and that can contain maybe 100 or 200 chips in a single wafer, in order to be able to measure them and test them, what I mean by testing is you need to actually have some kind of a fast feedback cycle towards the fabrication team. So this is what we think, because I'm a control theory person as well. I really like uh, feedback cycles and iterative cycles. Um, suppose then you actually have a target application for your uh, quantum algorithm, et cetera. You send it over to, say, the qubit designer or chip designer. You do your TCAT, et cetera, et cetera. And then you send it, then it's these kind of uh, fabless entities, they send it over to the actual fabrication team, determine what the material properties are, the, the I don't know, the fab, uh, fabrication recipe. Um, then after they found out a couple ones, uh, candidate chips in the single wafer in room temperature, they find out a few candidate uh, good ones, they, they cut it up, they dice it up, and then they put it up and load it up into the uh, fridge for actual, maybe further testing. And that we call characterization. So one question I want to ask uh, to the audience now, because you all are also very hard uh, experimentalist, how long do you actually think it takes from room temperature, say, this fabrication side, um, down to characterization and actually feeding it back to the chip design for a single qubit or a chip. Just a ballpark. Any order of uh, days, weeks, or hours. Can anyone tell me that? One week. One week, One week per chip? That's about there. And in terms of fabrication, you can actually churn out in the order of days even a single wafer if you really want to squeeze out the actual uh, throughput for, 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 yeah, if you really want to go for full manufacturing uh, scale. And one single wafer can have an order of, say, 150 to 200 chips, and a single chip will be around five qubits or maybe hopefully more, 20 or 100 or et cetera. And then that tells us that this feedback cycle is being hindered by the ability for you to actually measure and characterize your chip at, room, at, at, at really operating conditions. Your quantum physics properties, such as your coherence times, your cross coupling strengths, qubit resonator coupling strength, all of these things are only occurring at Cryo conditions. You really need to cool it down to 20 MK, for example, in the case of transmons, uh, that you can actually get all these properties. And the thermal cycle is hindered by how long it takes. What? About a, and that, that's why you get about a week per single chip, and that's only five qubits, or maybe even 20 if you're really uh, uh, hitting up the, 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 the testing uh, automation. So then that's what we think that testing your chips at cold conditions is the actual bottleneck that is feeding into your scalability. And this is what I think is the typical semicon chip testing. And then you can actually do that in room temperature right now. I think you all do that too. Um, for the JJ resistance checks and etc. But then this kind of feedback, we claim that we need this for the fabrication team at cryo conditions as well. Because it is still not sufficient uh, to know what your room temperature, um, say, electrical properties would. You cannot predict how your chip quality is going to perform. In uh, when you actually load it up and deploy it in uh, your quantum computer. 
So yeah. And then also to actually measure it, it's one big complicated graph of tasks. And every single one of them is a physics experiment. So this is an example of a tune-up graph for a five qubit device. Um, and of course, yeah, if we want to limit, let's say, so we did actually a uh, 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 quote unquote an algorithm, a VQA, a multi-qubit one um, for some kind of a parabola fit. Um, all of these conditions, all of these different uh, nodes, they are physics experiments. We start, of course, with the full observability and characterization of the system, latency corrections, mixer corrections, etc. But imagine right now the thought in a research lab, if you want to automate it, every single dot of this is a custom Python script in your research lab. How are you going to manage reproducibility across different research groups, for example? Now I'm going more into the research uh, community here. I can sometimes also see in open source projects, analysis. Huh? Each, each one of this is a physics experiment. It comes out a, a data set, and then you actually have to uh, analyze them and put in some physics uh, interpretation in order to move forward. And then I see in repositories like analysis or analysis underscore v1, analysis underscore v2, and then you have commit messages which says, oh, do not use this if you're using crosstalk measurements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That itself is a huge issue from my perspective, at least, because this is not how I would think as a engineering or engineerable uh, problem that can be solved. Unless, of course, we are getting more professional about it. And what I would say is that it has become a bottleneck, and that's the assertion, because then it becomes extremely expensive per qubit. It's also a very slow endeavor. And then because of the complexities and the customizations that are available, it's kind of really an exclusive club for you all, um, for a quantum physicist. Am I totally missing the point here? Or I don't know, because when I first started, uh, I had absolutely no clue what a cryoscope is. But yeah, Intel at the APS March meeting in 2022 identified, indeed, in order to test them at cryo conditions, takes about weeks per device. That we want to say, how are we going to then help out in this kind of uh, process and problem? Then what we identified is that, of course, the research community needs the flexibility, of course. Uh, but then it's also, you need to be cost effective. It has to be performant. You need to be also uh, transparent, at least, because even though we provide the, say, products that are going to well, standardize whatever measurements that you're doing, maybe in the physics level, um, you still need to rely on the execution or the analysis being correct. And this is where we get, we need feedback also from the users. Um, that is from the quantum computing research community. But then in terms of the industry, maybe companies like uh, IBM, Intel, IQM, for example, they really want, they already got the chip design, but then they really want to test these chips at a fast rate. And customized scripts are not going to fly or even customized uh, hardware architecture, etc. So it has to be well tested and then it has to be a turnkey solution. And what we provide for the research community is an entire R&D system that consists of everything that you actually need to run your physics experiments, except for the quantum chip. That provides the flexibility that you need, but then also from day one, we fully test 
these hardware interfaces and software interfaces to ensure that all of the physics experiments that you need to run are being executed correctly. And then the interpretation of it, that enables the automation that you need to get your QPU spec sheets out. And then after that, you can actually load up to your actual, I don't know, quantum computing stack for your hero device. Um, we provide some kind of a nested way of uh, different levels for products. Um, the R&D system is the full complete suite together with the software and then the cryo subsystem, um, cryo monitoring uh, system as well. And then we also provide the orange rack. And in order for us to perform this kind of automation, um, we rely, and we've done this uh, single qubit uh, characterization all in eight minutes. Um, yeah, and that is through our superconducting qubit tools and together with uh, our automation framework called GRACE. It's a task dependency graph. Um, yeah, we can only enable the automation through software, but then if you actually have uh, hardware interfaces that are compatible, then we can actually draw through the R&D system. Yeah, or we go through the hardware abstraction layer as well, and that's how we guarantee, uh, yeah, the physics abstraction layer is, um, yeah, uh, executed correctly. And yeah, please, uh, Contact me if you need more information about the the particular uh, features of this software as well as um, yeah the R and D system, and especially with the R and D system, it's all the equipment that you need for a lab to start with. Yes. Um, and then going into the industrial uh, entities, we're getting more into the turnkey solution, where through the EIC funding. Um, we're gonna have a few more, how to say, innovations to remain cost effective whilst actually providing the throughput for testing uh, at a at a suitable level. And these are all optimized uh, testing interfaces. And at the end of the day, customer will just load a QPU and then get a spec sheet out, uh, or a couple couple of QPUs, because then you get a, a higher throughput there. And then you can feedback for different fabrication recipes, for example. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, it's really making as turnkey as possible. Um, and that's the keyword, as turnkey as possible for the different uh, yeah, audiences. Let's say for research work, I can imagine it's never going to be, oh, plug and play but you need to customize also your own uh, calibration graph, for example. Yeah. Yep, thank you. <laughs>